The thing you'll get with a lot of prison staff is that they're frightened stiff. That if they say anything, they're going to lose the pension or... I have been formally cautioned and previously charged under the Official Secrets Act. Mm. And if it is an official secret, what's going on in our prisons, then I plead guilty. I'm telling you what's happening, you know. Yeah. It's the truth. What happens in strange ways stays in strange ways. You do not discuss it. You don't talk to the press. You mustn't tell your family what's happening. Tell nobody what's happening. Otherwise, you'll be charged under the Official Secrets Act. We had a click in strange ways that, that was that was bullying, not just in the inmates, but the staff. I mean, I myself was physically assaulted by prison officers. Was you? After you'd been hospitalised a couple of times, you know, you get the message. Mm. <laughs> well, there's a lot of Freemasons in the prisons, yeah? Is there? Well, a lot of Freemasons in the prisons, yeah. People are getting themselves into positions of authority, you know, and they'd promote their friends. It's corrupt. Mm. I knew somebody who went before the court accused of uh, grievous bodily harm. He gave that signal to the judge and he got the judge, <laughs> the judge threw the case out. What? Yeah. And I saw this governor, a wing governor, come out of his office at the end of the wing, up onto C2 landing where I was working. I saw this a couple of times. He was taking this category A out at lunchtime into his office. Wrote a report about this and took all the evidence. Went to see the chief officer about that. Oh, well, he said it's just probably something. Or that. I said, no, it's not. This is serious. So I went to see the inmate. He says, well, you know, when you've seen me going into his office at lunchtime, I said, yeah. He said, and you complain. He said, what I have to do is, he said, uh, he bends over the desk and I service him, you see, at lunchtime. He said, and in return, he gives me whiskey and takes my letters out and... So said, does he really? So I went to see the number one chief officer at Wormwood Scrubs, and he, he said, uh, who's given you the authority to investigate senior members of staff? Oh. <laughs> Get out of my office, seriously, yeah? I mean, they were condoning it. It just beggars belief. I've never seen anything at this level before. This is just my... You've never mind, heard anything like this before. It's no. going on all the time. Prisons up and down the country, the people are abusing their authority and manipulating and abusing inmates. And the higher up in the authority are, the more difficult it is to deal with them. Because if somebody on the ground floor reports it, all hell breaks loose. I am absolutely giddy to have John Sutton on the channel. John Sutton became a prison guard a few years after I was born. So we're talking decades of service, but also he's eclectic. We've got... Two hat John with the clap, including tracks, who's bagging my wife? <laughs> <laughs> First five minutes. <laughs> Nympho number three and who, oh God, the farting werewolf. He had a major book deal, best-selling author for Psychic Pets with Bloomsbury. He has now moved into the crime genre, true crime, Psychic Screw, The Violent Truth. How many books total have you got out there? Twelve at the moment. We're going to put links to the books and to John's YouTube channel and all of his socials in the description box below this video. So please please support his work. You'll be cracking up watching some of his stuff on YouTube. How many different prisons? I've been in many different prisons, but I actually worked initially at Wormwood Scrubs and uh, then to Strange Ways. And when I was at Strange Ways, I took uh, umbrage with the system and decided to correct it. As you can see, the... Uh, the, the news story that I was on the front page of the national press and I led a, revo a virtual revolution against the POA because the POA were in effect the management. I mean, you cannot have a chief officer running your trade union, but that is what the POA was in the 1970s, 1980s. So I said, there's no way, because I was studying at uh, Manchester University and uh, the government were paying for my course 
but I couldn't get any time off. So I said, well, listen, I'm not going to do any overtime. And they said, oh, no, you will do overtime. It's compulsory overtime. Now, I went to see the trade union, the Prison Officers Association, and in charge of that was a principal officer, you know, like an inspector. And he said, oh, no, that's the rule at this prison. We have compulsory overtime and you will do it. Try doing 60 hours a week at Strange Ways and studying for a degree at the same time. How are you going to do it? Impossible. I tried, but eventually it, I just failed the exams. I mean, I couldn't sleep. And my wife was, uh, I had a wife, of course, to look after and a child. And my grandfather, too, killed, and he was staying at our house, too, and I was nursing him. So it was impossible for me to, to commit the time to the studying. But it didn't do me any harm, and I made some good friends there, two solicitors who helped me form a trade union up against the POA because we said the POA were not independent. They were not an independent trade union. They were completely reliant upon the Home Office for their existence. They had no regional offices. They didn't pay for their own telephone calls. They had no regional bank accounts, no regional representation. They only had one office, and that was in London. And therefore, the argument was that this was not an independent trade union. This was, in effect, a tool of management. So how many different prisons then, did you say, and how many years total? Yeah, I, I, worked, I did uh, nearly 11 years. Yeah. I did uh, nearly two years at uh, Wormwood Scrubs. Then I was posted back to Strange Ways because I got uh, quite a great deal of trouble at the Scrubs, <laughs> which was interesting, you know. We're going to get to all that. Yeah. So one of the interesting things in your videos I saw, you were working in the medical unit... Yes. Uh, what happened was, I mean, they don't have it now, but in the 1970s, 1980s, they had what's known as the hospital service. So as a, as a serving discipline officer, I could apply to be retrained as a hospital officer. So I was sent from Strange Ways. I applied and passed the exams and what have you. Went to train at Walton Jail in Liverpool. And I did three months at the training school there, and I was seconded to the NHS for a period of time. Worked at Ashworth Secure Hospital for the criminally insane, and subsequently passed the exams to be a hospital officer. And I was stationed back at Strange Ways as a hospital officer, not a discipline officer. Because you verified something that people ponder about the UK prison system. So in America, prison assault, sexual assault, rape is so common, you have to go to a rape class to get taught how not to get raped. But you said they were coming in with the injuries, so you certified that it was happening in the UK prison system. Talking about homosexual rape? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it was, a, a, it was an irregular thing. It wasn't every week, but you would get people, inmates coming in, and they came into the, to the clinic because I ran a clinic in the, in the hospital unit at Strange Ways, and they would come in and their initial contact would be through myself as the hospital officer, and they'd make the complaint that they'd been anally raped. The, 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 the system that they used as a standard rule was that, that the aggressor would uh, forcibly rape the victim and then make them defecate into pet newspaper I mean, they're hiding the evidence, you know, mm -hmm. so that they, they get couldn't... Get rid of the DNA. Get rid yes. of the DNA or attempt to get rid of the DNA, make them defecate into a newspaper, which they then folded up and threw it through the window, out the cell window. But, of course, the victim had been damaged, and the people who came down... I mean, you can imagine what's going to happen, can't you? They, they've, they've been seriously damaged, you know, the, the, the rectum has been ripped... And a number of them were like, because you couldn't really treat it inside the hospital. So they were seen initially by me, then by a doctor, then transferred to outside hospital, say Salford Royal Hospital, which was the usual procedure. So um, there was a number of that. How many prisoners would actually come clean that they had been raped? A lot of the inmates wouldn't say anything. You know what I mean? It's embarrassing, isn't it? You know, they've been raped. And some of the people that were, that were doing this... You'd be surprised. I mean, I was, uh, 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 I mean, don't forget, although I'm working as a jailer, I'm just a human being, just a person. 
just like the prisoners, they're people too, just people. And, and they are ashamed of being attacked and raped. But some of the rapists were notorious villains. I mean, people like Paul Sykes. It isn't very popular to talk about Paul Sykes as being a male rapist, but he certainly was helping himself to the young inmates in prison. So we've got a lot of American viewers who may not have heard of Paul Sykes. Could you explain who that character was? Paul Sykes was about six foot four and about 17 stone. He was a very big, aggressive man, and he'd spent probably 20, 30 years of his adult life in prison. He'd fought for the heavyweight championship of Great Britain as a boxer against a man called John L. Gardner. And uh, the, the style of Paul Sykes' boxing was, I'm big, I'm strong, take that, except... John L. Gardner could box, and he gave Paul Sykes a real dusting. <laughs> you can look at it, have a look at it on YouTube. Type in we John will. L. Gardner mm. and Paul Sykes. Mm. That's Paul Sykes. Yeah, so, so, so you said he was, a, he was a perpetrator of these assaults, Sykes-y. It was He was notorious for this. He, he had uh, young, younger inmates. You know, he didn't like them... He couldn't get at them 18, 19, but he'd get them at 21, 22. And he used to take his pick of this. And he was notorious for actually physically bullying and attempted to bully staff. Now, he tried this at Strangeways Jail. Now, there's lots of people say, I'm too tough for Strangeways Jail. Listen, all the time I worked there, I never saw anybody win. I mean, if you were really on that verge of actually intimidating staff, then you got introduced to the school bully mm. or the black dog or piggy or the, what was it called, the Chinese money box. <laughs> it used to get hold of you and twist your arm up your back. <laughs> yeah. Well, the staff D1 was the answer. And you got whipped down to D1. And if you didn't, if you misbehaved on D1, then they'd send for the hospital staff. And the hospital staff would go in and uh, you got clearance from a doctor, but you'd have a syringe full of uh, Largactyl or whatever, hold them down and inject them in the backside. We did that to Paul Sykes. He was quiet after that, mm. as you mm. might imagine. Were well, some of the guards intimidated by him because he was known to just knock people out, wasn't he? Oh, you'd knock them out, yeah. But if you've got three boys holding you, three, three big guys holding you down, and you got me with a syringe in your backside, you know, you're going to be quiet for a bit, aren't you? <laughs> he was quiet after that. So how often would you say he assaulted young men? Well, whenever, whenever he felt like it. So very regularly. People would daren't report him, you see, because he wasn't on his own. He had a series of friends that were backing him up. Villains, some of them quite well-known villains, and some from actual Liverpool, actually who will we go, I'll, I won't name them. I mean, don't want to start talking about people like... There we go. <laughs> <sighs> Slipped out, folks, yeah? <laughs> Seriously, dangerous man. So there was a guy called... Yeah, his initials were... I won't name him, but uh, he managed to get himself appointed as the red band cleaner on the young offenders wing in strange ways. Now, the 1953 Prison Act stipulates that no inmate over the age of 21 may associate with young inmates. That's inmates, young prisoners, up to the age of 21. So they're, sits, they're kept separate. You know, they're protected because otherwise they'd be bullied and abused. But they had a separate wing at strange ways for this. And I was on that wing one day, and I saw this man, whose name, his initials are, and he was the red band cleaner. And he was aged at the time about 35. So I instantly recognised that he shouldn't be there. So I said, right, pack your gear and get off. Oh, no, he said, the principal officer has told me I'm to be the red band on this wing. I said, I'm not asking you to do this. I'm telling you, pack your gear, you're moving. Now, either you do it voluntarily or I'll get a team in and we'll move you. Mumble, mumble, mum, 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 packed his gear up. And as we were going off the wing, the principal officer came out and started shouting at me. 
What are you doing, Mr. Sutton? What are you doing here? He said, I've appointed him as the Red Bank Cleaner. I said, you know, you can't do this. It's a criminal offence. I said, but what I'm going to do is relocate him. And when I've relocated him in the adult section of the prison, then me and you can go and see the governor and you can tell him about how you are amending the 1953 Prison Act. How would you like that? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> but then, I mean, who's going to do that? Everybody else was walking past and leaving this actively homosexual to help himself to the young offenders. And that is what he was doing. He was changing his cellmate every other day so he'd get, an, get his, his pick of the chickens, he called them. Seriously. So why were they letting him get away with that? Uh, extremely rich man. So they were paid um, off. Um, you know what the score Corruption. is. Corruption. Mm. Multi-millionaire, drug dealer. Yeah, I don't know how much he'd given to the staff. But he didn't have enough to give to me, I'll tell you, because I wasn't having it. Bet corruption was rife back then. Well, the problem is, if you, the, the first time you take a bribe, you've had it. You will you. never yeah. go back. Do you want to hear a little bit about bribery in the prison? Yes. Of course. Anybody who's seen the documentary that was made in 1979-80, directed by Brex Bloomstein of the BBC, it's called Strange Ways. Is this on your channel? It, it, no, it's not on my... There's a bit of it on my channel. I thought so. Yeah, but the, the main thing is on YouTube. You can look it up, Strange Ways. In there, the, it shows a guy, a great big guy in the cell, shouting, you know, the roof's going to come off Strange Ways and ranting and raving. He was a big bouncer from Blackpool who worked in a nightclub, and he happened to be on my wing uh, at, at Strangeways on E4 landing. And uh, he said to me one day, he said, uh, hey, boss, he said, I, I want to change my cellmate. You know, will you get this guy in for me? I said, I can't do that at your whim, you know. I mean, you're a prisoner, get on with it, you know. Oh, no, he said, I'll make it worth your while. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I... Uh, I'm a bouncer from a club in Blackpool. I worked for Brian London, the boxer, you know. Brian London. Worked at his club. Brian London's gone now, so we're nice and safe there. <laughs> but anyway, he worked for Brian London. He said, all you've got to do is go to this club. He said, I think it was called a 007 or something like that. He said, all you've got to do is go to this club, mention my name. He said, and uh, the, the doors will open. You'll go in. You can help yourself to all the women there. As much as you want, anything you want, he said, but I want to change my cellmate. He said, if you keep doing that for me, he said, we've got a deal. I said, but isn't this not dangerous? He said, no, it's not dangerous. He said, lots of staff have done it. Oh. I said, oh, come on. I said, who's done it? So he gave me a list. <laughs> well, I've got a virtual photographic memory. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to see these, these staff. I said, listen, you've got half an hour. I am going to put a report in to the governor about this bribe I've been offered by this inmate, but he's telling me that you have been accepting bribes from him. So you've got half an hour to decide what you're going to say. <laughs> I went round to one of them. I went round to one of them who was a principal officer, and he started running round the centre in the, in the middle of strangers. You can't do that. You can't, I mean, like having a breakdown, you know. I said, no, you've got half an hour. It may not be true. I don't know, do I? But they're trying to bribe me, so I'm not having it. So I wrote this report out, took it in. Well, what do you think happened? What do I think happened with those people? Well, if the name's on the list, they usually get moved, don't they? Or at, at, at the least, or at the worst, you know, like suspended, investigated, or criminal charges even at the worst. Mm, no chance. No. What they did was... They took the inmate that had given me all this information and moved him. They moved him. From Strange Ways to Kirkham Open Prison. Now, as he was from Blackpool, I mean, he'd won the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'd won it. And they said nothing to this other staff. Wow. Nothing. And they never spoke to me about it either. Yeah. Nothing. Because they'd, they'd be short-staffed if they have to root them all out, wouldn't mm. they? I don't know if that's it. They're covering up it's the old boys' network. And that, yeah. Mm, but yeah. being bribed by inmates is very dangerous. I was at Wormwood Scrubs, and a guy joined the prison service. And uh, for his first few days, they attached him to work with me because I'd been there a little while, six months or something. 
and he was an ex-warrant uh, officer from the RAF. And he'd been handling men. He'd, he'd taken charge of the Queen's parades, and he'd met the Queen, and he'd been decorated. And, of course, this man's going to fart miracles when he gets into the prison service. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> so he went up listening to me. I said to him, I'll show you around the prison. And I said, but listen, these are not just soldiers, you know. These are inmates. And these are some of them are very sophisticated people who will, if they get the chance, manipulate you. He said, I, he said to me, I've been handling men for the last 30 years. I am the most senior warrant officer in the Royal Air Force. You know, as if to say, you can't tell me anything. I did try and warn him. He lasted about three months. And the last I heard of him, he was smuggling whiskey in. He was taking bets to the betting shop smuggling tobacco and he didn't smoke and they stopped him at the gate and searched him and he had tobacco and whiskey and betting slips and he'd just been twisted thing is your paycheck is so cheap back then and now for a prison officer mm -hmm. so it's so tempting to take those bets because we had lee davies yeah. on he was 18k starting salary so of and they were paying him 500 per package and he could bring in three packages a day yeah, I suppose the temptation is there if you're a crook. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I'm not. <laughs> so you, were, you weren't tempted at any point? No. No. I mean, I didn't join the prison service to make a fortune. I certainly didn't join it to enjoy bullying people. I wanted, I wanted it to bring my wife and family. That's why I did it. I honestly believed in 1974, when I first applied, that it was a career. Because they advertised it as a career, you know, and when I got in, I found out that it wasn't a career. All it was was opening and closing doors and shouting at people and in disgusting, disgraceful conditions that would have been an affront to the Victorian society. I wanted to ask what the conditions were like back then. Well, basically, uh, the conditions were filthy because they had no sanitation and I don't know what it was like where in the prison where you were, but they were locking three men, three adult men, into a cell, 12 foot by 8 foot, with no facilities to use the toilets. And they were required to defecate into a plastic bucket, mm. you know, in the presence of their cellmates. But they didn't do that. They used newspaper and they threw it out of the window. Yeah, I'll tell you a story about these. Uh, with, uh, listen, they didn't call them uh, presents. They called them ship parcels. <laughs> What they did was defecating the newspaper, throw them at the window. The number one governor, Norman Brown, had been in the club, which was a, a place where the staff would go drinking at dinner time, set into the walls of Strangeways Prison down in the basement. They had a, an alcoholic bar where they used to go at lunchtime and drink. And Norman Brown, who was the governor at the time, he's gone now. Norman Brown used to go in there and he was drinking with the staff. Then he'd come back in, and he came back in one afternoon, and he was in his office looking out the window, and he saw a ship parcel come flying out the window. So he thought, I'll teach these people a lesson. Seriously, no, the number one, the number one governor came out of his office, went round outside, picked up this parcel of human excrement, walked into the main prison and ordered the landing staff to open the cell where he said he'd seen it coming from. And when they opened the cell, he threw it at the inmate inside. It hit the inmate's centre chest, splattered all over the place, all over Norman Brown, all over the inmate, and he got the wrong cell. <laughs> <laughs> he got the wrong cell, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and by this time, Norman's covered in crap, yeah? <laughs> oh, it was disgraceful. I mean, what kind of a, what kind of a governor would do that? <laughs> One that's had about eight pints of Bollington's bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Just oh. one incident. One day, Norman, this is God's honest truth, Norman went down into the bar and he got himself tanked up again. It was a regular feature. And he went into his office. It was about January, something like that. And it was freezing cold. And I was working in the records office, which was directly opposite his office, but in the basement. And it would be about half past two in the afternoon, and he come running into my office, downstairs, the record office, covered in muck and dust. 
you maniac, you've burnt my office down. What he'd done, he'd fallen asleep in his chair after lighting the fire, drawn the curtains and set himself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and he blamed me. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I hadn't done it. How do people like that get in positions of power? Is it, is it all boys club? Masons, Freemasons. <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of Freemasons in the prisons, yeah. Is there? Well, a lot of Freemasons in the prisons, yeah. How does that work? Uh, well, I mean, they basically they join the Freemasons Lodge and it's funny handshakes and you're on your way up. Really? That's how it works. So do they get preferential promotions? About preferential the... promotions, yeah. I mean, the promotions were a lot of it was done through the uh, the Freemasons. I mean, but... Be honest, I mean, these people, they get themselves into positions of petty authority, but they have no authority. Incompetent. They're, 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 they just can't, they don't know what they're doing. They're on a wing and a prayer, basically. Certainly, somebody like Norman Brown was real, and they were reliant upon the staff totally. Hence, we had a clique in strange ways that, that, was, that was bullying, not just in the inmates, but the staff. I mean, I myself was physically assaulted by prison officers. Was you? That's how I came out of the prison service. But I think we'd better get that to that as we, as yeah. we go through this, you know. Did the Masons approach you to join? I have been approached by the Masons, but no. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't join. How did they approach you? Just somebody said, you know, would you come to uh, uh, an evening? I think it was a, a Christmas do for the lodge, you know. And so I, myself and my wife went... And it was very nice, but I thought, this is a bit strange, you know. In what way? Yeah. How was it strange? Hey. Did they put on a meal? Or? Yeah, no, no, they were all very polite, you know. But it was like a little boys club. You know, they're all chummy, chummy together. I thought, this just, just isn't right. Where was this? Where was it? It was I was at Manchester, but the lodge was at Sale in Cheshire. That's where the lodge was, yeah. What does the lodge look like? Well, and I mean, they just used premises, you know. Mm. You know, you didn't go into the actual inner chamber. No, no. But uh, the, the lodge was just basically like a, a functional club, you know, which was very nice and they were very polite, but it was all chummy chummy. And I got the impression that these were also rams, you know, that they were requiring the support, the, you know, they couldn't do it straight. You know, I don't believe in, you know, taking advantage. If you can't do it straight, don't do it. But they were they were doing it through the back end, you know. They were, people were getting themselves into positions of authority, you know, and they'd promote their friends. So you don't believe it's a brotherhood? I, I think they're, they're, they're almost, uh, it's corrupt. Mm. My dad, who was a detective inspector, was invited to join the Masons. And uh, he he was a Catholic, you see, and he went to see the priest and said, "I've been asked to belong John. You can't do it." He said, "It's against the, the religious teachings." So he didn't join. But the man that invited him to join, who was also a detective inspector, went on to be a chief constable. Interesting. Seriously, I mean, he was a very nice man. So when you declined them then, did they just accept that politely and they don't ask you again? Is that how it works? That's it. Yeah, the, you just, you're off. They asked my brother as well, who was a, also a detective inspector, but uh, he, he declined. He wouldn't join. He said he thought they were, like me, you know, just strange people. You must have had that look about you as a family. Mm, yeah. <laughs> what? What do you think? <laughs> what? <laughs> 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 I'm not going to be a mason. I wouldn't never do it. I wouldn't do it. I mean, God bless them, you know, if, if that's what they need, get on with it. But I don't need it. Ritual, ritualistic handshakes and dressing up and stuff. Back ends. Oh, believe me, it works. <laughs> I, I, I knew somebody who went before the court accused of uh, grievous bodily harm, gave the the signals, what's one of the signals, by the way? Yeah. Oh, is it? Is it? Yeah, yeah. Point your little finger that, down. Little finger down? Point your little finger down, yeah. Yeah. Point your little finger down. That's one of the signals, yeah, right. by the way. Women can't yeah. join, can we? Yeah. You're just like that. Just point your finger down, your little finger down. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, that's the signal. You give that signal to the judge, and he got the judge, <laughs> the judge threw the case out. What? Yeah, the judge threw the case out. The fellow well, I'm amazing, you see. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
Yeah, another another trick that the Masons pull is I, I'm going <laughs> to they'll be looking for me next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and another trick the Masons pull is uh, they get the dates wrong on your charge sheet. Wow. So if it's a mason that stops a mason and he's got to go through the motions but he'll get the he'll get the dates wrong you know so that you were charged on such and such a date you did this but you can prove that you were in spain or wherever alibi yeah you've got an automatic alibi because they've deliberately made a mistake in the charge and once you've been dismissed at court that's it you can't be tried again there is no double jeopardy any other tricks that they've got no, not that I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they'll come and get you. They'll come and get you. I'm surprised they've not they got you. Hey, after, after you've not After you've finished this, they will. <laughs> yeah, the viewers have got an endless fascination with Masonic stuff. We've had, <coughs> we've had people on who've defended the Freemasons who were Masons, debating with people who had conspiracies against them by the Freemasons. We had a cop, a Manchester cop. Yeah. There was a conspiracy against him by the Freemasons within the police, right. and they ran him out. They do. Yeah. They will, they will get you out. I mean, I believe that uh, that was how they got rid of me in the end, because I was physically assaulted on a number of occasions, and uh, eventually uh, I couldn't continue with that. I mean, after you'd been hospitalised a couple of times, you know, you get the message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to get to that. Yes. You get the message. We'll get to that. Well, yeah. The next question is, uh, you had a run in with the craze. Uh, what what no, do you think I, about the craze being yeah. legendary, iconic gangsters? Plastic gangsters? <laughs> yeah. Seriously. I could have done both the, tra the Cray Twins, yeah? Not a problem. They were in Brixton Prison, the Cray Twins, on the same landing that was run by my mate. I call him Big John, yeah? I'm not giving his full name, but he's, I call him John, you know, Big John. And uh, How big was John? He was about six foot two, but he was an Irishman, you know, and he was solid, you know, he was a big guy. And they were on his landing at, the, at, at Brixton, the Cray Twins, and uh, they were kicking off, you know, We'll, we'll do this, we'll do that. You know, the typical gangster kind of tactics. And John took them to one side and said, there's only one hard man in this prison and it is neither of you. He said, in the event that you play up again, he said, I'll take you both into that cell and beat the shit out of you. And of course, once the Cray Twins have been fronted like that, and John would have done it, one in each hand, not a problem. But once they'd been fronted like that, they couldn't, they had, they'd lost face, you see. So they put, uh, they got their friends outside to put a number on John and they, they sent messages in that he was going to be hit. I mean, how on earth are they allowed to be housed together? They were. Um, how? Maybe somebody's getting paid, I don't know, but they didn't pay John. He just, <laughs> he just had a word with them, you know. Did they find out his address then? Well, I mean, uh, he, he was living in the qu staff quarters at, at, at Brixton because he was a single officer. So they had people outside monitoring his activities. They, they would know where he was, yeah. So they shifted him from Brixton to Wormwood Scrubs, which is where I met Big John. I was on duty with him one night. And uh, we, were, we were doing that. It was in the YP wing, you know, 18 to 21s. And there were about 80 to 100 inmates in this wing. It's only a small unit, you know. And at night, around about seven o'clock, half past seven, you take round uh, coffee or tea, yeah, and uh, like a bun, you know. So when we got to the end of this thing, there was one bun missing. A bun, one of the buns missing, as John said, uh, who stole the cake, you know. Oh, nobody knew where it was. So he went back to the beginning, opened the cell up, went in and said, who stole the cake? Nobody said, bang, bang. It, every single inmate on that block, every single one, 80 of them, one after the other, great big six foot five inch black blokes, bang down the end of the cell. And when he got to the end of it, he found out that the cleaner who'd been distributing the buns, when he started, had put the bun in his cell. <laughs> so there was no cake missing. Yeah. That was, that was funny, yeah. No, okay. But I didn't know him at the time, you see, so I rang up the duty officer. I said, uh, 
that this man I'm working with has decided he's going to beat all the all the prisoners up. And he said, oh, you're working with John? I said, yeah. He said, uh, get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but he was all right after that, after we'd done all that. What did you make of the crazed boxing skills? They were, they were not heavyweights, were they? They were, they were light middleweights or something like that. So they would be reasonably, but nothing special at all. I mean, the, the skill that the Cray twins had was that they were psychopaths. They didn't have any fear or any compassion for hurting you. So they wouldn't think anything about hitting you with an axe or anything like that. I mean, normally, I mean, if you're going to hit somebody, you think, you know, this might actually hurt them, you know, so you wouldn't do it. But the Cray twins had got no restriction like that. They were both mentally ill and were they into the younger prisoners uh believe that they were don't forget i didn't actually lock them up myself but they were they were they were into all that i tell you who was into uh young inmates ian brady oh the, the moose murderer. murderer yeah oh. he was in uh, the hospital wing at wormwood scrubs and uh the reason that they moved him out was he was buggering all the young inmates. Oh. <laughs> he was getting access to them and forcibly raping them. I mean, how he was, was he getting like, access to them? Yeah, well, he was on a hospital ward. Because Ian Brady was uh, uh, mentally ill. So he was located in the prison hospital ward inside the scrubs. But when he started raping the young inmates... They moved him into the segregation unit, which was where I encountered Ian Brady for the first time. What was he like in, in person? Because he's tiny, isn't he? Yeah, he wasn't very big, but he was very nasty. I mean, he was a horrible-looking thing, and there's an atmosphere around him, like a dark cloud all around him, and he cold. And he didn't speak to staff. He wouldn't speak to staff. What he did was uh, he used to sit behind his door, his cell door, and he, every... 15, 20 minutes, you had to check on him to make sure he wasn't going to kill himself. So when you look through his door, he'd be sat behind the door, staring straight at the spiral. Oh, that's creepy. It's creepy, yeah? Yeah. And you'd go around and he'd be doing this hour after hour after hour, oh, okay. never moving, yeah, just staring straight at the spiral. And then you'd go around about 1 o'clock in the morning and he'd be in bed, you know, just... Straight into bed, yeah. But he was spooky. Some strange things about that man. Do you know, my father was on his case. No. Oh, really? My father was a detective sergeant at the time. And during the investigations into the Moors murders, my dad was on the case with Superintendent Joe Mouncey, who used to come and visit our house, you know? And uh, that's, he was in, my dad was in court the day that they, they played the tapes, you know, the tapes where oh, they plays the God. little girls. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a transcript of them with a little girl saying, we won't say anything if you let me go home? Yeah. Oh, so sad. Terrible. Mm. It's gone all cold around me just mentioning yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, it's wicked, evil. You know, evil bastard. Strange thing about Ian Brady. At the scrubs, yeah. I was on duty one lunchtime, and the senior officer called me down to the office and said, uh, there's a man coming in to see Ian Brady. He said, you won't look at him. You don't recognize him. You will not mention this. It has not happened. He said, and when he's in that cell with Ian Brady, you stay away from him. Stay away from that cell. So, really? You know, I mean, I don't know. Who is it? Jimmy you know, Savile. Jimmy Savile, no, but it was somebody extremely important from the House of Lords who came in, and he was immaculately dressed. Great big fella, big hefty, hefty bloke, but immaculately dressed. Savile Row suit, Jermaine Street shirt, you know, all the, all the lot, into Ian Brady's cell, and he was in there for about 15 minutes. And when he went in, he was immaculately dressed. When he came out, his face was all red, his tie was undone. What the hell had been going on? Saint sexual? I don't know. I can't say. I could only assume that something had happened. Oh. But it happened. See, the thing is, I not to identify him. I know who he is. Absolutely. But I'm not that mad. 
to actually repeat it. Mm. I value my life. Oh God, this is mind blowing, John. Yeah, God struck, aren't we? Well, I mean, did it, you recognise who it was straight away? And all right, instantly, yeah. yeah. You would know who it was. Oh, you would know it was. I can't tell you because it would be. Defamation. I mean, the thing is, it, 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 it doesn't matter that it's true. I mean, that's the worst defamation. <laughs> what other high-profile figures did you interact with? There was that horrible little scumbag called Frankie, Mad Frankie Fraser. Oh. Yeah, he was on uh, the, the, the A-wing at, the, at Strange Ways. You didn't like Frankie? No, I mean, he's a dangerous man, you know. He had injured numerous staff. I mean, he was only about five foot two and probably about ten stone, but he didn't face you face to face, or he'd go behind and hit you from behind. With a weapon. Yeah. With a weapon, yeah. Hit you in the back of the head. He hit one member of staff at Durham, and he hit him by the back of his head with a chair, and he shattered his uh, optic nerve, so he was blinded, the member of staff, blinded for life by this maniac... Frankie what? Fraser. And what happened to him for doing that? Well, I believe he, he, he got further time, but he didn't mind about that. Mm. I mean, what kind of a successful gangster is he? He spent 30 years of his life behind bars. And listen, during World War II, Frankie Fraser was a young man. He didn't join the army, he wouldn't join the army. He absconded from the army and he set himself up as a burglar. So whilst the blackout, in London, the Blitz was on. He was going round robbing people's houses. The men were away in Germany or wherever, fighting World War II to save Britain from the Nazis, while scumbag Mad Frankie Fraser was robbing their houses. Yeah, that's the kind of mm. villain he was, a scumbag. And the people who say, oh, he was a, he was a tough guy and all that, no, he didn't do it. He had people from the Richardson gang and the Cray twins nailing people to the floors of the old warehouses in London and he had a blowtorch and he blowtorched them and he had a set of pliers where he'd rip the teeth out. That is, is, is Frankie Fraser. And I saw him on air wing and it would be about quarter to one, twenty to one in the afternoon at lunchtime, you know, and when everybody's gone off for lunch. And I said, Frankie Fraser's out of his cell. Walking around the landings. I said, uh, Fraser, get back in your cell. Oh, no, he said, it's all right. The chief officer has said I can, I can not have to be locked up. I said, he can say what he wants, I'm telling you, in the cell. You know, so Fraser went into his cell and I shut the door. But uh, I went to see the chief officer. I said, what's all this about saying Frankie Fraser can? Oh, it's only Frankie, you know. I said, no, it's not. I said, he's a dangerous nutcase. And that's a danger to my life and anybody else. Because if he wants to, he can attack from behind. I don't know he's out. You've let him out. <laughs> Crazy. That, the chief officer was actually taking Frankie Fraser, you know, these Melton Mowbray pork pies. Well, he liked them, so he was taking them in. They were scared stiff that he would cause a riot or something like that. So he was favoritised. Yeah, they, they, were, they were favourably treating him. He was allowed to walk round in slippers. Didn't have to wear shoes or boots like everybody else. He said he was excused boots. Home sweet home. I mean, what kind of a gangster is that? Mm. So excused so boots, Fraser, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Wow. Yeah. I was the officer in charge of the records unit. You know, when everybody comes up, they got a prison record, yeah? Normally it's an A5 bundle, you know, something like that, an A4, whatever it is, but it's not nothing spectacular. Frankie Fraser's was a cardboard box, a cardboard box full of it. It'd been flogged twice. They used to order them to be, you get the cat and nine tails, and they used to whip them, and he'd been done twice. He'd been on bread and water. He'd assaulted staff. He'd been on riots. It, it, he'd caused a lot of trouble all the way through his prison service. And his record, as I tell you, it was a cardboard box full. Everybody else had little, <laughs> something or nothing, yeah? And I, I went through it one afternoon and I thought, what a maniac this is, yeah.
Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Harry's. Having such a scratchy face, I'm always delighted to get a new Harry's set. There's a foaming gel, hydrating night lotion, and the razor with the weighted handle really gets the job done. The trimmer blade makes it so easy to get into those tricky places to reach. The shave gel offers effective lubrication and just comes off like butter. It's such a smooth shave. It shaves fast, efficiently, no discomfort, and it is so smooth by the end. The hydrating night lotion is light and non-greasy. Harry's is doing a zero pounds trial. Start shaving with the products, just pay for delivery. Save every time. Save on all your shaving products without sacrificing quality. You're in control. You can modify or cancel your plan from the account page. Make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, and have your trial set delivered to your door. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. Well, I mean, and then he sets himself up as uh, giving people tours around the, the East End. Uh, Is he still alive? No, he's dead. What about Freddie Foreman? Freddie Foreman was in, uh, I think he was in Wandsworth, but I, I didn't work at Wandsworth. I did a little spell at Style, you know, the women's prison. Oh, yeah, we just had some stories from yeah. Style, didn't we? I mean, how does a women's prison differ from a man's? Well, basically, it was pretty much the same, except the women are worse. You what? Know? <laughs> yeah, they're worse, yeah. I, I mean, I was just there on security duties because they were, they were having the place refurbished. So somebody had to escort the engineers and the builders all round, you know. Uh, but the, the the female inmates were worse. One of them was in this cell. I don't know what the hell she was wearing, some like a, a, a straight jacket thing. She was rattling the cells. And she had uh, carbolic soap, you know, what? a big bar of carbolic soap, mm. except she'd carved it, yeah, into the shape of a a, a penis, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, she she got a carbolic penis, waving it at me, you know. Waving it? <laughs> yeah, woo, you know, I thought, well, I'm getting out of here, yeah. I'll t- tell you who else was in there as well, Mary Bell. Who's that? There was a, it's called The Strange Case of Mary Bell. I highly recommend you read the book. She murdered two boys when she was about 10 or 11 years old. What? Yeah, it's, it's, a, long, it's a long time ago. She was 10 or 11. 10 or, How old she were the boys? The boys were younger than her, you know, about five or six. Oh, my God. But she buried them on a building site, and then she went back a couple of days later and carved her name into the bodies. Yeah, Mary Bell, the strange case of Mary Bell. Do you know if she got access to those kids? I, I, no, she was, I don't know where she is now, but she was in style. But she changed herself from being a, a young girl. She looked like a bloke. And she was on the outside party, you know, tidying the inside area of the jail up. Strange thing about Mary Bell, the connection between Mary Bell and my family, when she was in, in, in a, an approved school before she was transferred to prison because she was only 10 of 11, she made a complaint that she was being abused by one of the staff. And the police officer that investigated it was my dad. Does he believe she was abused by one of the staffs? Uh, he didn't. He said that she's a very strange girl. Manipulative. He, yeah, and he didn't believe for a minute what she'd been saying about the staff, and he'd interviewed the staff. And if it had been there, then he would have done it. But he said, no, she said, she's very strange. And she was very strange when I saw her. And another strange thing about these murderers, when Myra Hindley... I was, I was about to ask yeah, you that next. Yeah, when Myra Hindley was taken out of prison onto the moors, you know, the moors at Saddleworth, and, and taken to see if she could locate the bodies... The police officer that escorted her was my brother. How strange is that? Your whole family have a link to yeah. serial killers. To serial killers, yeah, but only through operating on the on the side of the law. And what did he tell you about that day? 
he said she'd look, but she couldn't see anything. You see, the problem with Saddleworth Moors, it's moving. You know, it, it, it's peat moss, and it's not static. So if you put something in it, then it, as it moves, you know, because it's like a swamp, you know, then it moves around, so the bodies will be moved around. So you another know, friend of mine is Eric Eric Allison, you know Eric Allison? Rings a bell. He's the uh, crime reporter for The Guardian. Okay. Uh, Eric Allison was in Strange Ways. Uh, I didn't know him at the time in Strange Ways. I never met him in Strange Ways. But uh, when he was in Strange Ways, he forged a bench warrant from the court. He got Because he was a forger, you see. And uh, he forged a bench warrant and got his, one of his colleagues to serve it on the governor who instantly released him. <laughs> oh, my God. I've never, ever heard of that before. Yeah. Oh, wow. Seriously. I've seen it. Because the, the, the police officer that arrested him was my brother. <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway, strange things happen, and Eric Allison contacted me. He was writing a book called uh, A Serious Disturbance which was a, a, a story of the, the story of the Strange Ways prison riot. And he wanted me to do a chapter in there. So I wrote a chapter, I think it's called A Prison Officer's Tale. Yeah. And uh, that's, how I, that's how I knew Eric Allison. Uh, and it wasn't long after that that uh, he asked me if I'd be a witness for him in, in his trial. He'd been charged with uh, bank robbery. <laughs> And where are you? I could only speak that I knew him as a writer, you know. So I went and spoke at his trial and said, yeah, I know him as a writer, very gifted writer. He is. I mean, and look at him now. He, he is the crime reporter for the National Guardian newspaper. He was a brilliant writer, but he was also a crook. <laughs> or he was at the time. He isn't now. He's going dead straight. Yeah. So what is the story of the Strange Ways Riot? Ah, well, I wasn't working there at the time, but I don't believe the story that they put out, you know, that uh, they suddenly lost control. I mean, it wasn't that long since I left that this riot took place. And the idea that the staff would just throw the keys in and run out the jail, it's just impossible. I'll tell you something. Right about that time, the government were trying to introduce something, I think they called it, Fresh Start. And Fresh Start was a change in the working systems for the prisons. You know, that the, the, the overtime would be gone. There would be no overtime. They would recruit staff to, to actually make up the numbers so they could continue as they were. And the staff didn't want to lose their overtime. I knew members of the Strange Way staff one of them, one member of staff, 30 consecutive days from 7 o'clock in the morning till 9 at night. Yeah? And there was one guy there called, they called him, believe it or not, Coco Bennett. That's what they called him. He's gone now. Coco Bennett. And the reason they called him Coco Bennett was at night, about 8 o'clock at night, the staff would take round a, 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 a bucket with, the, with, with all the... It was a Coco, you see. <laughs> he did so many overtime, so much overtime, that they called him Coco Benny. <laughs> I mean, imagine doing 30 nights consecutive, 7 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. No. You've got to be mad to do that. <sighs> but my belief is that the Strange Way staff liked this overtime, and when it started to get threatened, they had to show that there was a reason behind this. We don't want to lose our overtime. And at the same time... There was the poll tax riots all over Britain. People were, Maggie Thatcher's idea of, of not charging you rates, but charging each individual person uh, a, a fee, you know, like a standard fee. And there was riots against that because it was going to mean all the people in the council housing estates and they were going to be paying. Yeah, so they didn't like that, so they took to the streets. But as a distraction... Strange Ways Prison Riot did the trick because from being on the front pages, all these riots had gone. It was all about the Strange Ways Riot. So there's a number of factors there that all fall into place 
Don't forget, we have mentioned this earlier about the Freemasons and all that. And they were they were the senior staff at Strange Ways. They were all Masonic. A, lot, a number of them were Masonics, yeah. Now, it may be that it came through the back door, we want this to go off. But it didn't go off a little bit, did it? <laughs> it just got completely out of hand and they ripped it to bits. But that was honestly the only way it was going to change. And you're very level-headed. For, for, so for you to say there was a Freemasonic conspiracy, that it was in the best interest, they thought it was in their best interest. They thought it was in their time. best interest, yeah. Mm. That's really mm. strong. After, after the riots, when they put the people who did the riots on trial, the defence contacted me and asked me if I would go to court and give evidence for the defence against the Crown. So I went to Crown Court at Manchester Crown Court and spoke against the government and said, in the event that I had been kept in the conditions that were prevalent at Strange Ways at the time, then I would have taken the roof off because there was no other way. They weren't going to listen to any complaints. I mean, at Strange Ways, they had a system whereby you could make a complaint and your complaint would be heard by the governor, Norman Brown at the time. And one night, Norman Brown, it was New Year's Eve, and they, they had a brass band in the club. And they were pl obviously playing in the new year, you know. About half past 12, he took the brass band out of the prison officers' club, in to Strange Ways, into the rotunda. You know what it looks like, yeah? Like a spider, like a big wheel, yeah? Into the middle of that, and struck up the brass band, and it virtually blew the place apart. Can you imagine it half past 12 at night, yeah? So the following day, there was all these people lined up to complain about this disturbance in the middle of the night. And who was hearing the complaints? Norman Brown. And his answer was, you're imagining this, get out next. Seriously. I'm, how mad is that? I'm insane. Yeah. Since, it's some of the craziest stuff I've heard in my life. <laughs> yeah, there was, we had one governor one night. I was on I was on duty one night, and it would be probably about twelve o'clock. And the gate, the officer in charge of the gate, the other officer in charge of the gate, answered the gate. Somebody banging on the gate it was the police. They'd arrested, believe this or not, in the centre of Manchester, the deputy governor for being drunk and disorderly in the, in the middle of Manchester. Seriously. So they said to the gate officer, is this man, the, the deputy governor, yes, he is. He says, well, get him a cell and put him to bed for the night, otherwise we're going to lock him up. So if I'd have been the, the deputy governor, I would have thought, well, I've got away with that one, you know, thank God for that. But not him. He was still pissed. He decided to do a, an inspection of all the Category A prisoners. So he went round the prison waking all the Category A's up, every single one of them. And the, the principal officer in charge of the, of, the, of the jail at the night allowed him to do that. Now, if it was me, I wouldn't have done that. I would have said, you're mad, you piss off. You know, but no, he did that. Trunks in charge. Strange world. What Was happened to him that evening? Oh, I don't know. He just went his sweet way, you know. I mean, the boys protect the boys, don't they? That's, what, that's the way it works. How many different category levels have you worked in? I mainly worked in category A prisons, you know. I did some time. I Was at uh, Ashworth. Strange thing about Ashworth. I was at, when I was first at the scrubs, uh, I went into the hospital ward when I'd only just joined. And the prison hospital officer who was in charge of the ward said, Come in, John, you know, sit down, welcome to the scrubs, have a cup of tea, mate. And he called this inmate over and he said, Make my friend here, John, a nice cup of tea. So, sure enough, I got a cup of tea. And he said, Would you like a biscuit, you know? So I had a biscuit as well, you know, nice. I thought it was very friendly, you know. And then when I'd drunk all this, he said, do you know who that was? I said, uh, no, he's just the orderly as far as I know. He said, no, that's Graham Young. Graham Young 
was convicted of poisoning about 20 different people. He killed about half a dozen people. He put all different kinds of stuff into the tea, yeah, and killed them. And he was serving lifetimes, I don't know how many, at the scrubs. And this, the hospital officer got him as the tea boy. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's twisted, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> and I didn't know. <laughs> Any, anyway, uh, anyway, years go by, probably about four years go by, and I went to Ashworth Hospital, and I was just walking through Ashworth Hospital, and I saw this guy who looked like Hitler. He'd got this moustache like that, yeah, and I, I could see in his cell, and he'd got a, a Nazi flag on the thing. And it was Graham Young. And he came out of his cell. He said, Mr. Sutton, how are you doing? Nice to see you again, John. So he'd remembered me. He had a phenomenal memory. <laughs> why, why did he become a Nazi? Oh, he was just mad. <laughs> he was absolutely stark staring mad. He said to me, have you got two minutes? I said, yeah, when we're at Ashworth, you know, he said, I'm going to show you something here. And he had a cigarette. And he put it in this dish. He said, what you do is you get some water, you put it in on the cigarette. He said, you leave it there for a day or two. So then you take the cigarette away and the water that's left is, is enough nicotine to kill somebody. What? He said, and you just put it in the tea. <laughs> 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 yeah, seriously. He was teaching me how to poison people. <laughs> I said, you've got to be joking, Graham. <laughs> Is that was actually always, factual? I don't know. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, nicotine poisoning. Oh, my God. Yeah, seriously. I mean, he, he was he was mad. He was mad. Perhaps it's more concentrated if you drink it, like the nicotine instead of smoking it. I don't know. That's, that's what Graham Young told me. And the Doesn't strange thing was there was a number of staff at Ashworth Hospital went off sick. They didn't know what was wrong with them. I didn't bloody Graham Young. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was dangerous, that man. But I was always affable with him, you know. I was on duty one night at the scrubs, and he, occasionally he was off his rocker, you know. And uh, I was put in charge of the... He arrested some two men in Brighton that were, that were said that they were sent by the IRA. They had a hit list. And they had to come over here and kill people. Honestly, these people had a World War I revolver. They had a list that said things like the Queen... Buckingham Palace, the Prime Minister, Downing Street. That was their list, yeah? And, and these two lads, they were only lads. They were drunk out their heads. They didn't know where they were. And they put them in a cell within a cell in, in, in the scrubs, you know? So I said to them, do you know where you are? Where are we, boss? They were Irish, you know. Where are we, boss? I said, you're in the scrubs. Who's that now? You know? I said, you know, it's a... Big prison in London. A hey, prison? What are you doing in prison now? You know, they didn't know where they were. They were absolutely out the head. And then Graham Young was kicking off, and he was in a padded cell, and he was singing, Daisy, Daisy, at the top of his voice. Oh, my God. So I said to these two, I said, because they couldn't sleep because of the noise, I said, we'll give him some back. We'll sing an Irish song. So we were going to sing Danny Boy, but they didn't know the words. Imagine oh. Irishman who didn't know the words to Danny Boy. So I sang them Danny Boy until the hospital officer in charge of the place came down and said, for God's sake, shut up. <laughs> then he went in and I all heard this, ah! <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd shut Graham Young up with a needle in the ass. <laughs> so were they patsies then? Did someone make a headline out of that story? Yeah, they were just... They were, they'd been suckered into it. They never did anything. They couldn't have done. They could hardly stand up, and they didn't have reek of alcohol. Mm. You know, when somebody's had a skinful for days and days and days, you know, they were obviously pissed out of their mind, and they didn't even know where they were. No. So how strong are the IRA in the Cat A's? Well, the Cat A's were, uh, IRA's were at, straight, uh, at the scrubs. Yeah, I, I crossed their path a few times. I've heard they're quite strong because they're considered like a military. Yeah, they wanted force. To, they wanted to have military status. You see, mm. well, I can understand it. I mean, I'm partly Irish. I've got Irish ancestors. I'm not unsympathetic with the cause, but blowing people up, I kind of draw a line at that, you know. But uh, they were in the scrubs and they thought they were military. And, and I don't know how this happened. I got put in charge of their visits. You know, so when they came in, I had to sit in on their visits and make notes about what they were. You can imagine, yeah? 
What were they talking about? I don't know they were talking about what you might talk about. You know, I was, I was anti-flow going on, you know, and all this. They weren't talking about plotting anything, you know, nothing like that. Just the usual banter that you would get in a family. Mm. But the fact that I'm sat there making notes kind of, it was intimidating for them. And I tried to say to them, look, I said, I'm just doing my job, you know. I'm not doing this for fun, you know, and I'm not going to intimidate you. See, the thing you'll get with a lot of prison staff is that they're frightened stiff. But if they say anything, they're going to lose the pension or... I mean, I did a big article for The Guardian. Uh, what was it called? Loose Screws, it was called. Seriously. And uh, at the end of it, I said, I have been formally cautioned and previously charged under the Official Secrets Act. Mm. And if it is an official secret what's going on in our prisons, and I plead guilty. I'm telling you what's happening, you know. Yeah. It's the truth. So a lot of guards are afraid to speak out then because of the, the fear of this Official Secrets Act. Yeah, I mean, there is a scene in the uh, documentary, Strange Ways, at the start of it, the screws thing, where Norman Brown, who is the number one governor, is cautioning all the young prison officers who had just been recruited. And he's telling them that what happens in strange ways stays in strange ways. You do not discuss it. You don't talk to the press. You mustn't tell your family what's happening. Tell nobody what's happening. Or the, otherwise, you'll be charged under the Official Secrets Act. Do you have to sign any paper? For you have to sign to be signed under the Official Secrets Act. Uh, during the time that I was there, I told you that I previously decided that the Prison Officers Association was little more than a tool of management. In fact, it effectively was the management. So I decided we had to do something about that. And I had friends who were solicitors and they helped me draft up uh, 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 the, the application to form an independent trade union, which we called the Prison Force Federation. And uh, a number of staff, a lot of staff at Strange Ways were, were supporting me for this because they too realised, you know, that they had no representation. And I offered them a system whereby we would have a union that was only for non-supervisory grade staff. And I went all around the country lecturing on this. And uh, in fact, I came to Liverpool and I was invited by the staff at Liverpool Prison to go and speak to them about why we needed an independent trade union. And uh, believe this or not, the governor at Walton Jail and the chief officer called a staff parade on the morning that I was due to attend to give a speech in the uh, local, they hired a hall for the evening, yeah. Masonic sabotage. Mm. They called a meeting and they called all the staff and they warned them, they said, in the event that any one of you attends this meeting tonight, being spoken to by Mr Sutton, you will be expelled from the Prison Officers Association. And the Prison Officers Association is a closed shop at Walton Jail, so you won't be working here. So they performed a witch on you? Yeah, well, yeah. they did that. And, you know, they had about 100 people who were going to attend and I ended up with about two. <laughs> yeah, I was interviewed on the radio, on BBC Radio Merseyside. I said, where were the staff? Where are these shrinking violets? Yeah, <laughs> hiding away. Come on. They, wouldn't, they didn't, didn't dare to do it. I went to one to give a lecture at uh, HMP Durham. And when I got to HMP Durham, I went to the function room where they were, because I was I a bit late, you know, but I was only about half an hour late. Uh, and when I got there, there were two blokes on the on the on the door, and they said, "What's your name?" I said, uh, "Who are you? You know who we are." And it was two chief officers from HMP Durham who were standing at the gate, at the door to this function room, taking everybody's name, taking the staff's name who went into this meeting that I was going to speak. And when I got in there, there was about half a dozen people. It, the bloke who organised it said he had over a hundred and hundred and fifty ready to speak to me. But as soon as they saw the chief officers standing on the door taking their names, they disappeared. I mean, what kind of a carry-on is that? It's the power of the POA and the Freemasons. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That they, they had them terrified. And the, the problem was there was no way through it. In the end, believe this or not, 
the, the Home Office uh, officials and the POA put out a notification that I was a member of Colonel Gaddafi's uh, f uh, revolutionary army what? and that I was here on, on his behalf to cause chaos in the British prison system. That's what I was going to be doing. That's what I mean, yeah? So there was a conspiracy against you then? Well, the conspiracy was, that was the conspiracy. But it frightened all the staff. And I, and I was called by the BBC to do a big interview. And I went and did a, you know, like a 6.30 at night interview, you know, saying why we needed a, a, an independent trade union because the, the inmates were being abused. And this was in the system. That was their system. They abused the inmates. And, that, and they thought it was all right. It was run and condoned by the government through the POA. And uh, when I went back in the next day, they charged me with, uh, uh, I don't know when it was under the disciplinary code. They, if you look at that Strange Ways documentary, there's a, there's a section of it where the governor and the chief officer are sat together going through the rule book, deciding what they're going to charge me with. Now, the chief officer was a member of the Prison Officers Association. He is supposed to be in, in the same union as the staff, i.e. me. And there he is, sat down with the number one governor, preparing a charge against me. What happened? I got taken in, uh, before a board, and they, they, they charged me with uh, breaching governor's directions not to appear before the press or the media. And I was found guilty and I was uh, reduced in rank or whatever it was and uh, disbarred from applying for promotion for seven years. And it was uh, scare tactics, you know. And I appealed against the judgment to the Secretary of State on the grounds that it was ultra vires, it was beyond their power to, to discipline me because I was the elected general secretary of a trade union. And as I was the elected general secretary of a trade union, acting to promote that union, I was protected under the trade union law. And the secretary of state upheld my appeal and cancelled it which meant that they weren't really going to get me because they weren't that smart. So that's when I started to get attacked. <laughs> what was the first attack? First attack was uh, an, an inmate one Christmas day, and I can't understand why he did it, because it, I think, you know, that the word got round, you know, that something had to be done. But the various staff threatening me. One fellow, we called him Big H, yeah, so I have literally forgotten his name, but he was called Big H. He was a hospital officer, senior officer. And uh, he'd been drinking in the club. He came back onto the, onto the landings, and uh, I was on the second landing, and he was on the first landing. And he started shouting abuse at me, at me while I was unlocking the prisoners to get their ablutions done. I'm gonna, when I get my hands on you, I'm going to rip your head off, you little bastard, and all this, that, and the other. I said, you can't be serious, you know, grow a brain. <laughs> you know, but he, he didn't stop, you know. So I, what I did was I got sheets of paper and I went around and took statements of all the inmates who'd witnessed this. Then I wrote my statement out and I went to see the governor, Norman Brown. I said, I want you to put these in my record of service. He said, what do you want this for? I said, well, you're employing a maniac who in full view of Everybody who's there to listen is threatening to physically abuse me. So he happens to be about six foot five and about 19 stone. And it's possible that he's got a chance of doing this. Said, so in the event that he does, I want it to be in my record of service that I have told you that this is a dangerous, drunken man who is intimidating and threatening me. He said, well, I can't do that. I said, just put it in my record of service, if you don't mind. Get out of my office, you know, so... Didn't, didn't really get anywhere, but he never threatened me again. But one, it was Christmas Day, and uh, I lived about 10 miles away from the prison, and I was in charge of the clinic, and with me was another hospital officer. It was a clinic on uh, the, the Boston Allocation Centre unit in strange ways. 
and I was in charge of the clinic, and uh, we were both working it together. So as it came around to lunchtime, I said, listen, we, were, we, had, we had to split the lunch up, you know, I had an hour, he had an hour. I said, you can have my lunch. I said, I'll just sit here and read a book, you know, I've got a glass of wabi, all right, and you can go and see your wife and family because he only lives two miles up the road. Oh, he said, that's very nice of you. I said, it's all right. Take your time, come back when you're finished, you know, a couple of hours, you know, so he can have my lunch break as well as I. I said, I won't be saying anything, will I? So I got on with it. Anyway, it got to about 2 o'clock before he came back, and he'd left about 12. And when he came back, yeah, he looked really white, and I said, what's this? You've got a face like a slapped ass, mate. What's the matter? And uh, he was stunk of booze. He hadn't been home at all. He'd gone to the prison club, drank a vast amount of booze, lost all his money on slot machines and these things, and, and, and therefore he was in a, a very vile mood. He jumped over the table and grabbed hold of me and started to throttle me, strangle me. And in the, in the clinic, we got bottles of Largactyl, all the tablets, we got the syringes drawn up for the diabetics. If I'd started fighting back, we'd have smashed it to bits. I had to just roll with it, you know, and try and protect myself. And uh, when, he, when, he, when I got myself free, because somebody came in and pulled him off, yeah, when I got myself free, I rang up the duty officer in charge of the prison and reported this. So they came down, they said, oh, well, we'll, we'll move him to another unit. I said, he's drunk. He just physically attacked me. And you're telling me you're going to move him somewhere else? Well, we've got to... I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to the hospital. So I went to the hospital and I was off for about 10 days. He damaged my larynx. I couldn't eat for about a week. Hell. That was That was one of the first ones. What, what was the next yeah. one? Well, I was subsequently, a, I was going on to the duty. I was in the charge. I was actually in charge by this time because I passed all the promotion exams. And I was in charge of the psychiatric ward at Strange Ways. You know where they go to get, re re you see them at court say, remanded for psychiatric reports in custody. Well, that's where they go to. They go to a big ward, about 20 of them on there. And uh, I was the officer in charge of that ward. So it was lunchtime and it would be about, I don't know, 20 to 1 in the afternoon. And I was going up to do the afternoon shift on the ward. And this senior officer started shouting at me. And I said, listen, leave it, leave it alone. I said, if you really want to be aggressive with me, charge me with some discipline offence and put me in front of the governor. Do not threaten me and abuse me. I said, because I'm not going to listen to this. And I just walked away and was going up, up the stairs, very steep stairs, because it was upstairs. As I got about halfway up, he ran up behind me and grabbed hold of the back of my tunic and started to drag me back down the stairs, dragged me physically back down the stairs. So I took my left fist and right on the end of his snot box, took him from half the step to the bottom. And there was witnesses watching this. There was one of my colleagues at the bottom of the stairs and somebody else at the top, and they gave statements to say they'd seen what had happened. And they suspended me. How cruel. They suspended me, so I went, oh, I said, I've had enough of this. And by this time, I'll be going to get psychologically, I'm getting paranoid, you know. <laughs> What's going to happen to me next, you know? So I went to see my doctor, and he put me on the sick, and I never went back. Never went back after that? No, oh the, the, the home office sent me to uh, see a psychiatrist. And uh, the psychiatrist what? said... Uh, he said, I'll listen to what you've got to say, Mr. Sutton. He said, and uh, I've come to the conclusion that you are perfectly sane, but strange ways is absolutely mad. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and you're not, you're not to go back. No. So I never went back. And how did you feel leaving it? Well, don't forget, I joined uh, to, to support my wife and family. I didn't want to just walk out and have no job. Well, that's basically what happened. So, they, they, but they, they give me a pension, you know. 37 years later, I'm still drawing the pension, and they're all mad. <laughs> so what do they think about you having a YouTube channel? I'm have not been, really asked them, have I? Have you been contacted by anybody? No. I'm waiting for it. 
Official Secrets Act. I'll tell them the same as I told the Guardian. If it's an offence to tell the truth, then I'm guilty. Mm -hmm. Kudos to that. So what was life like once you came out of there? I was all right, really. I'd been running, you see. When I was about uh, 30, I weighed about 15 stone. So I thought, I've got to do something about this. So I started running to get to lose weight, you see. And the, in the strange ways, they had two physical training officers who were the P, they call them PTIs, you know, physical training staff. Yeah. And they were runners. Yeah. So I sat, I went to see them. I said, Long, I'm going to start running, you know. And they thought this was hilarious, you know. Yeah, I start running. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, I'm going to do a marathon. They said, you'll kill yourself. Yeah, so I said, uh, all right, well, I'm going to start running. So I got myself some running shoes, and I went out running with them one lunchtime. Well, they nearly killed me. <laughs> yeah, seriously, it was that hard. We ran from strange ways up to a place called Boggart Hall Clough, which anybody knows the area of Manchester will know that is. Ran round there and back. Well, they ran there and back, and I, <laughs> I think I walked the last bit. <laughs> but I eventually did it because I did it every day, and it came to the marathon, which was being run in the August. This was about February. So it took me about six months to get to the point where I could run a marathon, and uh, they were in it, these two <laughs> training instructors. Did you beat uh, them? I beat them, yeah. Wow. I, I went round in three hours, 20 minutes, and uh, I don't know where they were, but they were certainly behind me. I ran past one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I got a T-shirt that said, Faster, faster, come on, Barry, because one of them was called Barry, you see. <laughs> so I, I used to run, go running with this on at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Made me laugh, anyway. Mm. Yeah. So with the Cat A's, then, it's like in America, would that be the equivalent for Supermax? Is it Cat A? Yeah, the category is that everywhere they went in the prison, they had a book. You know, and the book had to be signed. Tell you a story about Cat A at, uh, at the Scrubs. It was on uh, C2 landing. And I saw this governor, a wing governor, come out of his office at the end of the wing, up onto C2 landing where I was working, at lunchtime when it's all locked down and everybody's gone for lunch. And he unlocked a Category A prisoner and took him out of the cell. And I, I went to said, uh, this is a category A prisoner, so he, you know, he cannot be moved during the lunch hour, the lockdown in the prisons. I am the governor of this wing. He said, I'll do what I want. So I contacted the principal officer who was in downstairs. He said, he's the governor, he can do what he wants. Really? So anyway, I saw this a couple of times. He was taking this category A out at lunchtime into his office. Really? So one day I was working in the censor's office and a letter came in for this inmate who was a notorious armed robber serving 18 years for shotgun robberies in London. And the letter was from the House of Lords and it was from some Lord such a body, I don't know who it was, I forget now. But it said, how wonderful to hear from you again. I trust that they're taking care of you at Wormwood Scrubs. I will certainly be coming to visit you soon and I will send you my best regards. Yours sincerely, lots of love, whatever his name was, the House of Lords. So the only way that a prisoner can receive a letter in prison is in response to a letter that they've sent out. You can't write in to say Charles Bronson and he'll get it, he won't get it. It has to be a letter that he's sent to you so you can't directly contact any inmate. So for this member of the House of Lords to actually write in and thank this prisoner for his letter meant that a letter had gone out, except he had a letter sheet and there was no nomination on there, no record of any letter being sent. So I made a, a, a wrote a report about this and took all the evidence. Went to see the chief officer about that. Oh well, he said it's just probably something. Oh, I said no, it's not. This is serious. So I went to see the inmate. I said, right, who's smuggling your letters out? He said, what do you mean smuggling letters? I said, you've got a letter here from Lord Suchabody. I said, you wrote to him. Yeah, he did. I said, well, 
it didn't go through the census office because we notify you everything. Who took it out for you? He said, I can't tell you that. I said, you are about to tell me that. So I said, well, if you insist, it was the wing governor. I said, well, why would the wing governor want to take letters out for you? He says, well, you know, when you've seen me going into his office at lunchtime, I said, yeah. He said, and you complain. He said, what I have to do is, he said, uh, he bends over the desk and I, uh, I service him, you see, at lunchtime. He said, and in return, he gives me whiskey and takes my letters out. And I said, does he really? So, seriously. So I wrote a report on this. As I'd, I had a way of doing things, you see. I thought if you do it formally, you know, and do it properly, then you're doing your job. So I went to see the number one chief officer at Wormwood Scrubs, gave him my report, gave him the evidence, all the rest of it. said, I previously mentioned this to you. There's the evidence. That's what's been happening. And he, he said, uh, who's given you the authority to investigate senior members of staff? So I had a warrant card, you know, and it says on it, whilst acting as a prison officer, you have all the authority of a police constable. I said, that's my authority. I'm doing my job. Get out of my office. So I never thought, I thought, well, I've done my job, you know. That's what I had to do. I've done my job. So I was on the landing, and uh, about four or five inmates, one after the other, coming up to me saying, what the hell have you been doing? I said, oh, doing anything, you know. Because I used to get on with them all right, you know. And they said, no, there's two senior police officers downstairs in the offices calling people up and asking them questions about you. What? Well, they were trying to stitch me up. Trying to get some kind of... Giving it some of that. Yeah. Mm. Seriously. I think it probably was. But, I mean, that's how dangerous it was. If they could have done stitch me up, they would have... They would have done it properly. That wasn't the only one. On Saturday morning, it would be about half past ten, something like that in the morning, and the inmates from Sea Wing had gone out on exercise, onto the exercise yard. And I was left in charge of the, the ones land, the first landing. And as I was walking down the landing, I looked into a cell that was open, and in there was an inmate dressed in choir boy's vestments, you know, Dressed as a choir boy. So, obviously, he's not allowed to be dressed as a choir boy. He wears prison clothing. So I opened the door and said, come on, why are you dressed like this? Take it off. He said, uh, he said, I can't tell you. I said, Yo, are you going to tell me? Sit down on this bed. Are you into-? And he started crying. I said, oh, come on now. It can't be that bad. He said, it's the, the, the chaplain. He said, he comes round while everybody's on exercise, and I have to get down on my hands and knees dressed as a choir boy and fillet him, which is a polite way of saying sucking his dick, you know. But uh, that's what he was doing. So I said, right, take that cast off, put it into uh, his pillowcase, and I wrote a statement out, got him to sign the statement. I wrote my statement out. Once again, went to see the chief officer. Another case of how dare you investigate senior members of the staff. <laughs> Get out of my office, seriously, yeah? I mean, they were condoning it. It just beggars belief. I've never seen anything at this level before. This is just my. You've never heard anything like this before. It's no. going on all the time. In prisons up and down the country, the people are abusing their authority and manipulating and abusing inmates. Seriously. Wow. And, and the higher up in the authority are, the more difficult it is to deal with them. Because if somebody on the ground floor reports it, all hell breaks loose. And, of course, they couldn't, get, couldn't stitch me up because, I don't know, they just didn't, didn't have a plot. You know? But they certainly made my life misery. It sucks. It wasn't the only thing. When I went, uh, this, this is what really made me angry. I joined the prison service to a career, yeah? I believed mistakenly that it could be a career. I did. I didn't join to do anything else. I joined to earn a wage and have a proper pension at the end of it so I could look after my wife, yeah? And seriously, uh, I got to Wormwood Scrubs and I've been there about four months, five months, and I was applying for a quarter, a prison quarter. 
and they kept saying, oh, no, you'll not get one now. There's no prison quarters, you know. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll rent a flat. You know, uh, I didn't want to be parted from my wife. She was in Manchester, and I was in London. You can't do that. So I tried to rent a flat, but all my wages, the whole lot, wouldn't rent a flat in London. This was in 1975. So I was really angry at this. They were supposed to provide me with somewhere to live. They'd moved me from Manchester to Wormwood Scrubs. So I and I applied. I went to see the POA, and they said, oh, no, it took me 18 months to get a quarter. You'll just have to wait. I said, you must be joking. So I was angry at this. So one of the staff I knew on my wing, his, his father was the chief officer in charge of the works unit. The works department, they used to have a works department, they don't know. So I said, ask him how many quarters there are that are vacant at the scrubs, empty. And it turned out, he came back to me a couple of days later, he said there were about 16 quarters empty. So I went to see the POA, and I said, what's this about 16 quarters empty? And I'm waiting, you know, to be allocated a quarter. And, and I've been here four months, and my wife's in Manchester. Oh, no, they said, we're saving, we hold them quarters back in case we get any senior officers posted in from other prisons. They're expecting 16. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know what they were expecting. <laughs> but, but So I, I, this really infuriated me. And this is the POA telling me this, you know. So there were a number of prison officers at the scrubs who were waiting for quarters. Their wives were all over the place. So I got a list and I put my name at the top of it. And I went round the staff and I said, we're going to go and see the governor, yeah? I said, I'll go and see the governor, but I want a petition to make them release these empty quarters, yeah? So I wrote it at the top. I went to see the governor. Didn't ask the chief officer, just went to see the governor. And I gave him this petition. I said, uh, he said, well, what do you want me to do with that? I said, I want a quarter. I said, because if I don't get a quarter at the next month, I said, me and all these officers here will be at the front of your prison with placards and you can tell the press, because they'll be there, you can tell the TV how you don't allocate quarters despite what you're contracted to do. Get out of my office. So anyway, next month I got a quarter. Oh. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I was allocated a quarter. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And uh, these other staff came to see me and they said, how come you've got a quarter and we haven't? <laughs> so what do we do? I said, all you've got to do is get a sheet of paper, put your name at the top, <laughs> go and see the governor <laughs> and tell him you're going to demonstrate outside his prison. <laughs> yeah, well, they wouldn't do that, would they? They didn't have the nerve to do it. But I mean, that wasn't the end of it. Believe this or not, I was there in the quarter. We moved in, me and my wife. And uh, it would be about half past nine at night. I'd been on nights, or a late shift, you know. And I got into the quarter and I could hear all this shouting and screaming down. So I said to my wife, what's all that going on here? She said, oh, it's a gang of louts. They come round and they're shouting. They were shouting up at the, up at the houses, you know, the blocks of flats. Shouting up, come on, missus, we know your husband's away. We're going to come up there and give you one, you know. I said, how long has this been going on? She says, oh, it happens on a regular basis. I said, right. So I had a little dog. I put the dog on a lead and I went down to see him. I said, you can't hang around here, you know. These are prison quarters. So you don't live here. Just go and play somewhere else. They were about 17, 18. They weren't kids, you know, and they were big, big lads. And uh, so they said, oh, piss off. And, and, one, and the biggest one said, do you know who I am? And I had an idea who he was. He was the eldest son of the chairman of the POA. So I said, I'll go and see your father. So I went to see him at his home the following day, knocked on his door, I said, I want to see you about your son. I said, come in. I told him, I said, you can't have him going around the quarters at night shouting abuse at people who live there. I said, and it isn't just that. I said, I believe that they've been urinating into children's prams, you know, oh intimidating the people who live there. I said, now, I would like you to tell your son to stop. I said, because there's going to be trouble if he doesn't. And, uh, you, I mean, you'd think that, you know, you'd say, well, thank you for telling me, not him. He said, in the event that you put a hand on my son, he said, I'll see you in court. 
I said, are you joking? I said, there's going to be trouble. They can't keep on like that. Anyway, it, it subsequently transpired that one day his son and two other louts were on the stairs going up to my flat. I said, come on, lads, shift, I need to get up the stairs, climb over us, you bastard, you know. Well, you know what you've been saying. So I tried to climb over, and one of them kicked me in the eye. And it really hurt my eye, all swollen up and bleeding, you know. So I went to the police, and I asked to see the duty inspector, and I made a report about this. And he said, uh, that I said, I want to see the duty inspector. And I did see the duty inspector. And I made a complaint. He said, uh, I've got a word of caution for you. He said, uh, in the event that you lay your hands on any of these lads, he said, I will personally arrest you. And I said to this police inspector, you and I are going to meet again. About a month or two later, it was the, the cup final, Manchester United in the cup final. And me and one of the other officers, who was a friend of mine, we decided when we'd finished our shift, on the Saturday afternoon to go for a beer at a local bar. So we walked down there, and as we started walking down, this gang of louts started walking behind us, shouting abuse. So I said to my friend, I said, well, just forget about it, you know, just leave them to it, you know, they go away. So we went into the bar, and I was stood at the end of the bar, and these gang came in, three big lads, and they had glasses in their hands, and they said... Right, son, we're going to kill you now. And they got about here, and I just <laughs> flattened a lot of them. Bang, bang, bang. As you would, you know. Because I knew what I'm doing, you see. Uh, anyway, they fall on the floor. The ambulance came, took the big one away, the son of the, ch the POA officer, yeah, took him away in an ambulance. Apparently I'd fractured his skull. I didn't know. I was defending myself, you know. The police came and charged me. Seriously, I said to the police, three big men come in, threaten to kill me, and I defend myself. You charge me. Yeah, so anyway, I ended up at uh, Knightsbridge Crown Court. You can imagine, I've joined this job to earn a living. <laughs> I'm at Knightsbridge Crown Court. Yeah. And, and the, the dock officers, when I was in the dock on the second day after giving evidence and all that, the dock officers said to me, you see them two men there at the front? I said, yeah, I see them. They're there to take you to prison. You're going to an open prison. I said, do you think so? They said, oh, yeah, you're going to get guilty. Anyway, it took the jury about 10 minutes. I didn't even have time to drink my cup of tea. Yeah, not guilty. But I, I imagine having to go through that, my poor wife. Did you have to testify on your behalf? My wife couldn't testify on my behalf because she was at all. Oh, did you testify on your behalf? Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that one of the questions was, uh, the guy prosecuting said, I'll put it to you, Mr. Sutton, that you are an expert in self-defence. I said, I'll put it to you that you're right. Mm. Self-defence. <laughs> I said, and, and I am entitled to defend myself. <laughs> right, isn't it? That's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I think the argument was I'd defended myself a little bit too well. Excessive force. But how do I know if somebody's coming at me with a glass and they've got two big lads? These were six foot two inch lads. I'm a five foot eight, you know. Anyway, that was the end of that. You'd think that would be the end of that. No. You would. No, it wasn't the end of that. Oh. He won't, This lad thought that he was a tough guy. He was obviously the local... Th Heavy, you know. So he was waiting for me one day. And when I came up the stairs to go to my, he chased me, ran after me. And, and somehow he managed to catch me up, you know. Don't know how he did that, but he caught me up. And uh, I gave him the best hiding a boy's had for a long time. Uh, we, we were halfway through this. And he starts screaming, I've had enough, I've had enough. I said, shut the fuck up, I haven't started yet. <laughs> I mean, I know it shouldn't be done, but what can I do? I had to teach him a lesson. And what do you think happened then? Another case. <laughs> Back in <Yeah>. court? <laughs> Back to the court. <laughs> yeah. Only this time, I, I, I managed to get, get a cross summons against him and charged him with this oxy chase. But he said, my, I, I was living. 
I'm entitled to go as far as my doorstep and I don't have to go over my doorstep. I can protect, so that's what I did. And uh, I, I was found not guilty and he was found guilty. Great. Yeah. So he, he's got himself a criminal record. Good. And I got sent for by the Home Office to go to uh, Stag Place, I think it was, and uh, the regional the regional director of, of, of the South East uh, Prison Service sent for me into his office. Big office, nice office. Yeah, and at the back of him there was a map with all these maps, pins on. And he said to me, your name's Sutton? I said, yes, it is, sir. He said, you see that map? He said, I said, I see it, yeah. He said... All those flags on there, on that map, their prisoners pick one, he said, because you're not working at the scrubs. So I said, I'll go to Strangeways at Manchester. He said, right, get out. That was the end of it. Threw me out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, oh. how, that's how I got back to Strangeways. How different was Strangeways from the... Well, when, I, any when, I, when I got back to Strangeways, I got to the gate and the officer on the gate, I knew him. And he said, what the hell have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> he said, the, the prison's full of stories about you. He said, I said, I said well, you've got, to, you've got to stand up for yourself, haven't you? 100%. You, I, I couldn't help it. What can I do? So do you have a military background that you had training? Yeah, I was in the army for five years and I was the regimental middleweight boxing champion and, and fought, fought for the BAOR title and uh, Do you feel that carried you through the years? Well it, it, it taught me how to hit somebody you know because if you hit somebody most people will just do do a little thing like that but that's, that's not going to get you anywhere that's going to tittle them but if you do it properly they go out and I knew how to do it properly you see so th during those five years in the military, what did you do? I started off in the Royal Artillery. I joined the Royal Artillery. See, the, the story behind that, which is in my first book called Screwed Up, which is available on Amazon, folks. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I started off and I was working in the factories. Now, I could see that the factories weren't going anywhere. Absolutely, it was because we were using equipment that was built in the 1940s, 1950s, and this is the late 60s. So I thought, I've got to get out of this. So I joined the army, and uh, I went to see the army, and the army said, great, you come in, you've passed the test, you can go in the Royal Artillery. Great, I'll do that. Because my idea was the artillery, they ride about on trucks, you know. You go in the infantry, you run about. <laughs> so anyway, so I did that, and... Uh, he said, but you've got to take your papers and you get your parents to sign, because I was 18. And at that time, the age of majority was 21. So I went back to my parents and my dad said, you're not joining the army. We're not signing your papers. I said, oh, I can't continue working in the mills. You know, it's just dispiriting. It's not going anywhere, you know. So he said, well, we're not signing. So I went back to the army and said, uh, I can't go through with this they said well there is a way they said you can apply to the government to be made a ward of state he said you've got to go before the magistrates and ask them to assume the authority of your parents and you'll be made a ward of state and the magistrate will sign your documents and you're in the army let's do it off to the magistrates and on the bible swore them and i was in the army when I went home, they went absolutely bloody wild. You can't join the army. I said, I've got the rail warrant here. <laughs> I'm off. <laughs> and I went off and joined the army. Yeah. And uh, it was all right. So what funny, but, what funny army stories have you got? Oh, too, too many. I mean, there's a lot of them. But I joined the army and, uh, listen, I was, the army's bullies. You're a lot of bullies. You know, and there was one bully, he was a sergeant who was in charge of our, our troop. And he was the usual industrial sized giant, you know, six foot four, big barrel chest, you know, lift, lift, all that nonsense, you know. So I went to bed at about 10 o'clock at night, and uh, I, I'm asleep in bed. And all of a sudden, whoosh, I'm on the floor. Somebody's thrown me out of bed. And I could hear all this laughing above me. And I saw this, I, it was just somebody miles on down here on the floor. So 
standing over me, laughing away. So all I knew was he got his boots there and I put my hand under his trouser bottoms and whipped his feet away, whipped his feet from under him. And this giant sergeant came flying down, bang, on the floor. So he hit the floor with an almighty crack. (laughs) I got all of the top of his head and I was just about to sink my elbow right into his forehead, which would have terminated the bastard. (laughs) When when the two NCOs who had been on the piss with him grabbed hold of me, no, don't do it, don't do it. (coughs) They carried him out. (laughs) They carried him out. The next day they called me up and said, have you thought about joining special forces? <laughs> and couldn't charge me, could they? No. Hey, imagine it going, going that before the colonel. Well, I threw him out of bed and he, he, <laughs> he put me out of his. He wouldn't do it, what can you say? <laughs> I thought that was funny anyway. So from there, I went to the parachute regiment, did the parachute course. You must have talked to people who've done this. Oh, yeah, I've had a few yeah. paras on, yeah. Yeah, it's murder. How so? Well, you've kind of, you never stop running. I mean, and you try running 20 miles with a 70-pound pack on your back. All right. Yeah, and carrying, a, 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 they had a, like a, a, a stretcher, mm. and it's got concrete blocks on. You've got to run with that up and down the brook and beacons and all that. You really go through it, you know. And then they had a thing called the Trainasium. You can look at it up on, on YouTube, the Trainasium. But when I did it in the 60s, they didn't have any safety nets or nothing like that. In the 60s, it was real stuff. And you go up about 25, 30 foot in the air, and you've got to balance on these parallel bars, shout your name, rank, and number down to the people below, PTIs below. Bend over, touch your toes, hold your arms up, and then you've got to jump off the top onto a pole and get yourself down to the bottom. So I did all this. I jumped off, got hold of the pole, and I was so relieved to get hold of the pole. I failed to grip it, <laughs> whooshed straight down to the bottom. It was, I did, it was all right, you know, I landed okay, but I could have really killed myself. It was that far down, yeah. And the thing was, the parachute regiments, it's still the same old army bullshit. We did the milling, you know. And I'm only about five foot eight, but I weighed about 12 stone. I was solid. And they, they, they did you by height, you know. So the guy who was the same height as me weighed about nine stone. So they said, oh, we can't do that. So there was a guy on the course, on, on the, it was a, a military policeman who was a usual giant, you know. I said, why don't you ask him if he'll do it? So they said, uh, you know, because he'd already done his milling, you know. I said, would you do it again? Yeah, no problem at all. I gave him my rights. It took me about 10 seconds to flatten the bastard. Out and, I, and then the, the, the physical training instructors who were judging you on this, I said, what do you rank, 10 out of 10? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was in the block, and uh, th- these two, I don't know who the hell they were, came in and they said, uh, would anybody play rugby this Saturday for us? You know, So I said, I'll play scrum half, that's all I can play, you know, it's the only position I know, scrum half, you know. So he said, all right, we'll, we'll give you some training. Get yourself down to the quartermaster's store, get a box of uh, Vim and come back and clean all the showers. I said, no, if you want people to play rugby, I'll do that. If you want people to clean the baths, then ask. The answer's no. Oh, I'm a potential officer. I'm telling you to do it. I said, I'll take your potential officer's arse and kick it right through the fucking door. Now piss off. Anyway, the next morning I got called up by the colonel. In charge of the uh, charge of the course, returned returned to unit. Eh? <sighs> what for? I passed all the the course. You know, I done all that, but they said, "Oh no, we're not having that kind of action here." Eh. Potential officer, my ass. <laughs> Did eh? you get dispatched anywhere around the world? Yeah, I was in Libya in 1969. Believe it or not, oh, that, that might be where they got the idea that I was with Colonel Gaddafi. You see. Maybe. Yeah, but when Libya, when Colonel Gaddafi took over Libya in 69, I was there. We were at uh, a place called RAF El Adam, was the base, but we were out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And we were there one day, and the, 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 the sergeant major came back, walking out of the desert into the camp. We said, well, where's your Land Rover? 
said, no, the, the Revolutionary Army have just stopped me, take my Land Rover, take my weapons, and said, get back in and tell us to get out of Libya. Well, we couldn't get out of Libya because they wouldn't allow any flights in. And we were going on a boat. We were in the middle of the Sahara Desert for about six months. Wow. Six months. And they put me in charge of a, a, a unit that was guarding the armory, you know, all the weapons, that we still had weapons, yeah? And uh, so we went out there, and the, the Libyan Revolutionary Army used to get Land Rovers, their Land Rovers, and, and surround us and put the lights on. And we were marching around, so we hadn't. We got strict instructions, do not open fire, yeah? No, you mustn't fire back. They were shooting rounds over our heads. It was a little bit scary. So I said to the soldier, I said, listen, I've had enough of this. I said, we're in the spotlight, so we'll give them a show. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, do you know the song from Oliver was a musical at the yes. time? I said, we'll go out there and sing him a song. So we practiced this, and then we went out there singing, Come sit to yourself. Oh, dancing up and down like that, you know, like a, a like a, a Hollywood show, and all these Arabs, <laughs> they us like that. They got the lights on as well. They put us on stage, so we give them a show. <laughs> I thought that was funny, but the captain who was in charge of the whole thing, he came running out. You maniacs! What do you think you're doing? I said, "Well, we're entertaining them, you know." Oh. How did you get keep supplies up then if you're out there for six months? Mm. I don't know. What they, well, it was the RAF was an RAF base, so they they had supplies in the base, but it was terrible. I got dysentery oh. in the in the dysentery. Listen, I was in a dysentery, and they hospitalised me. Okay. It was that bad. What's the I, I just, of dysentery. Dysentery. It's, it's a disease of your of, of intestines, oh. you know, in your stomach, and you, there was an infection there, and I I couldn't water straight in, straight out the other end. Terrible. Oh. Um, so they put me in hospital, yeah, and they put me on a dehydrated thing and all that. And uh, there was a, a, you know what the Quaranks are, the Queen Alexander Royal Army Nursing Corps? Well, it's the, like nurses, but they were in the army, you know. And the, the matron was a, a captain, yeah. And she used to come in and say, right, sit up to attention in bed. I said, I'm ill, you know. I'm not well, that's why I'm here, you know. I'm not on parade, I'm ill. You don't insult me, I'm a captain, you know, this, that, the other. You maniac, you, you silly bitch. <laughs> now, one night, I'd been in there about three days, and I was slowly getting a little bit better, and uh, they brought a drunk in from the uh, logistics corps, and he was a, a, a giant Irishman, must have been about 6'3", huge, great fella, you know, and the, the MPs brought him in because he was drunk and incapable. And they put him to bed in the in the ward that I was in. The, the MP stripped him off and covered him up, except about five o'clock in the morning. He's got his arms over both sides of the bed, his head his, his head right back, his feet hanging off the bottom. He was a giant, you know. He's lied there, and he's only covered it with a sheet, except he started to get an enormous erection. <laughs> And he'd got no clothes on. So I got out of bed and pulled the covers off him. Yeah? Because every morning this quarank, this captain, used to come in. So I'm in bed <laughs> waiting for this nurse to come in. <laughs> she walked in. And this guy's lay there snoring, snoring his head off with a giant hat on. And she, she took one look at it. She knew I'd <laughs> threw the cover over him, yeah. <laughs> but half past ten, I got discharged. <laughs> I even got thrown out there at the hospital. <laughs> it, it made me laugh. Mm. Yeah, it's strange stories. Mm. Oh. So, so we're getting near, near the end, John. And um, are there any stories that you feel that, that we've perhaps missed out that you would like to tell us today? Well, there's a, there's a lot of it. I mean, going into it about about people who thought they were notorious. People like uh, the Black Panther. The Black Panther. You remember oh. the? You remember that fact? His name was David Nielsen, I believe it was. Uh, he'd murdered this girl, Leslie Downey, I think her name was, and he'd strung her up, and he was blackmailing the family to get the money, you know. Otherwise, I'll murder your daughter. But she'd already been dead, and he'd done a few. He'd done about four, I think, 
and he thought he was a tough guy. He was in D1 at Strange Ways. I went to see him uh, of a morning, you know, to just check on him. And he would be doing press-ups, sit-ups, step-ups, running on the spot. This is first thing in the morning. Come back at lunchtime, same thing. Evening, never stopped. All day. No stopping. I'll tell you a little bit next time if we if there is a next time about the exploits on the exploits on D Wong about staff urinating into the soup and oh you know if you really want to know yeah we do yeah, yeah I'll do that another time did yeah. people mess with the panther he was about five foot six you know if he really wanted it he'd have got the hammering of his life I never saw anybody win down strange ways I saw some big bastards none of them won. Did you ever have to patrol the sex offender areas? Yeah, yeah, I did all that. Is that a lot different from the general population? Yeah, <laughs> easy, easy. But just unlock them. Then, you, then, then when you want them to go back in, you just say, get it yourselves, bow! And they go and lock themselves up, you know, just... Because if they don't, you know, somebody might get them, might they? Mm. And did you ever um, come across them getting got... Oh, yeah. I mean, Ian Brady got scalded at the scrubs. They dragged him into a recess and poured boiling water over him. He, he didn't like that, you know. Mm. That he, he objected to that. Was that the water with the sugar in it? I don't know if they did that. I think it just was boiling water. It seems to be a fairly new invention, but they did in sugar, boiling water with sugar to stick to you and uh, boiling fat, you know, boiling yeah. the butter up and lobbing, throwing that over them. Prison can be quite a violent place. Yeah, yeah. All right, there you have it then. We've got a little uh, tidbits for next time. If we do a part two, please let us know in the comments. Would you like to see more of John Sutton? And don't forget, he is a prolific, best-selling author. It's not all about psychic pets, you know. We've got Psychic Screw. Indeed. We've got Screwed Up, was it, the other one? Screwed Up, yeah, that's the screwed early part up. of my life. Any, what, what else have you got in the Screw series? Uh, I'm working on the next one. Next one. Yeah. If you want to listen to his fabulous CD. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can look that up on uh, YouTube. Two Hat John with the Clap. <laughs> Not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> it's got parental advisory on it, so yeah. Yeah, it has. Big stuff, big stuff. So I'd recommend people go to John's YouTube channel. He doesn't hold back like you've heard today. It's no nonsense, but he's got a unique way about him that gets things done, and we salute him for that. So, <laughs> Definitely. Thanks for coming thanks on, John. Today. Cheers. Thank you. Brilliant. Yes. And he's got the hardest, hardest handshake of any of the guests. <laughs>